Good morning, everyone. Um, yep, microphone's on. <laughs> um, welcome, and uh, first of all, thank you for uh, XWiki to organize this, this dev room. Um, my name is uh, Sandra van Doren, and uh, I, today I'll show a bit of the things that we've done during the last few years um, for a project at the uh, European Commission. Um, my colleague is here as well. Uh, I might pass on some questions to him. Uh, no. um, so it's a project that we've been doing for a few years, uh, and well, some um, well, we discovered some interesting things with integrating a knowledge graph with a CMS. So, who am I? Um, my name is Sander. I live close by in Leuven. I'm an independent consultant, so I'm not uh, representing the European Commission here in any way. It's just uh, some of the things that uh, we did there. Um, I'm working there on, on software architecture, um, and I, well, uh, apart from that, I have a, I'm, I'm um, intrigued by uh, all sorts of complex systems. So um, these are the contexts. I put the slides on uh, Penta. But I noticed that I forgot to put the file extension there. So if you get the, if you download, if you would download them, just put uh, pptx behind. I tried to change it, but uh, the system, um, well, it was a bit overloaded this morning, so uh, I lost that opportunity. So um, the place where I work is uh, is ISA. It's a unit um, that promotes everything open from the European Commission side. So. We work on open source projects. Um, so uh, the goal is really uh, to promote interoperability between public services. So uh, that can be on uh, data models, but um, well, one of the things that we have is the um, interoperability framework. Uh, we have a reference architecture that su supplements that framework. All of these things are clickable in the slides, but uh, I, I'll skip quickly through it because there is not a lot of time. The main thing I wanted to point out here is join up because that's the action that actually we, the, where we did all of this uh, work for. Uh, and that's the content management system um, that is based on Drupal. Uh, and one particular thing that might uh, be of interest of, uh, to you uh, outside of the technology behind it um, is the licensing assistant that we have on, on this platform, which is a, sort of a wizard that helps you in selecting an open source license. So if, you're, if you want to see uh, based on the criteria, uh, it helps you determine what is the best license for you. So a quick agenda, what are knowledge graphs? Uh, how does Drupal and the CMS world um, integrate with this from uh, how we then how we put everything together in one system architecture so the the how things uh, relate to each other um, some conclusions and then the question and answers knowledge graphs well what is a knowledge graph i don't know how familiar people are with the concept um, but I'll, I'll try to explain quickly what, what uh, goes into it. It is, in fact, a, um, a list of statements. And a statement can be something of the form AW1120 is a room in ULB. And you will see that I, uh, I underlined parts of the statement and another part is um, in uh, italics. Um, this is really to indicate that, well, in this small sentence, in this statement, there is a subject, there is a predicate, and there is an object. And I'll come back to this uh, later. I, uh, are knowledge graphs something new? Absolutely not. Um, they're sort of rebranded uh, of what uh, Semantic Web was in around the 2010s. So uh, I probably somebody at Gartner decided that it was time for some new terminology and introduced uh, knowledge graphs. The big difference with uh, the 2010s is that at least now there is a decent set of tooling around the whole uh, concept. So now you can really uh, work with these things. So st we have statements. Um, if we throw these statements together, they form a graph 
and that is our knowledge graph. You'll see different kind of terms thrown around, so linked, linked data, linked open data, semantic web, knowledge graphs, RDF, all of those things are just you know, synonyms for the same thing. Well, they're not 100%, um, but they cover the, if you look around on the web, these are uh, all sorts of terms used for the same uh, kind of IDs. Uh, everything in knowledge graphs, and that is what is, makes it particularly interesting, is based on standards. While a lot of graph databases to think uh, the Neo4j's and the, they are based on very loose, well, they define their own standards. And um, but what we use on the on the semantic web is really W3C standards, like yeah, you would have HTML, um, but so. The information itself is described in, in RDF, and that is a specification which, is, uh, which makes it very robust and, I mean, very portable. Uh, so we have RDF, that is the specification that defines how you can express statements within a knowledge graph. We have, of course, those statements. We can make arbitrary statements, but things get a bit more interesting if we put things in a data model. That's where uh, RDFS and OWL come in. Um, they allow you to express uh, classes of things and how you can instantiate things. You need a way to query all of this madness, and that is what Sparkle is. Sparkle is also very standardized, so it's, an, it's a standardized query language uh, that allows you to query uh, RDF data. And really what it all comes down to is uh, RDF is to information on the web, what HTML is to documents. Documents uh, express are a way of expressing information about a resource. Uh, so a uh, URI uh, on, on the web is uh, a universal resource indicator, so it's really the identifier of, of a resource, and a document is a way of representing a resource. And the same way we can represent uh, resource with a document, we can also represent it uh, with RDF. So um, a machine readable version, so the information is readable for the machines instead of uh, HTML documents that are readable for humans. Um, how does RDF work? Uh, if we see here our table of beers, um, some might be familiar of yesterday evening. Um, <laughs> What we do to express a, a tabular form in, in RDF is we take our ID, uh, we form it, we turn it into a URI, so we put something, it looks like a URL, but it doesn't necessarily uh, point to a document on the web. We take our uh, column name uh, and we turn that into our predicate, and then we take our value of the thing and that we transform into an object. So in RDF, we always have this form of uh, subject, predicate, object. And this way, we can describe whatever information uh, that we want. Sometimes this can get quite big, uh, because you have to be quite verbose in your uh, in, in statements. But in the end, you can, with this simple uh, format of, of subject, predicate, object, you can model the whole world. Objects, uh, it's important to point out, everything here, subjects and predicates and objects, can always be uh, URIs. So uh, subjects and predicates have to be URIs. Uh, objects, on the other hand, can be either a URI or they can be an, um, an XML type, like a, a date time or, or something of, of that. Uh, yeah. Then, um, what's all of this about? Well, the magic is really in the, in the URIs. Uh, since, well, you make a statement, it's somewhere on the, uh, you make something, a statement starting describing the world with your domain name as the first part. If you then, if somebody else makes, uh, this is describing data uh, in another domain, well, you know that you'll be able to merge everything conflict free because, well, you, you just have a list of statements on one hand, you have a, state, a list of statements uh, coming from another place. Uh, you can uh, concaten concatenate uh, the two together. What is another very interesting aspect uh, of, of having these uh, things uh, uh, displayed 
or uh, represented with facts or statements is that you can um, build your applications in a way uh, because they, they, make, they operate on this graph of data in a way that they uh, ignore uh, everything that, is, um, that they cannot understand uh, outside of the data model. Now, RDF, we can represent it in multiple ways, or, uh, XML, JSON, Turtle, or uh, any other sort of uh, serialization. So if your web service works with JSON, you could add a bit of context and uh, transform it into uh, linked data or uh, graph representation. I'll have to speed up a bit. Um, why would you want to do it? Well, this idea of uh, applications, uh, separating your application from the data is very important. Uh, instead of um, putting logic in your application layer that knows how to interpret certain um, structures in your database, everything is directly expressed in the data itself. And then as I already mentioned, well, you have this possibility of ignoring facts. So you can really um, subclass uh, or make uh, application profiles of a data model and sort of specialize them for your application context. Uh, so a, a very generic standard, and then make something for your application, miss, add the missing parts, and then this data can still be interpreted by applications that handle, that work on this uh, generic uh, data model by simply ignoring the things that, uh, that you stated that they cannot understand. Now, well, yeah, the obvious, the obvious things that uh, big corporations are using Knowledge graphs for now are the the um, interactive assistants like the uh, the telescreens of Amazon, the, the you know the um, what are they called the the, the things you can talk to um, <laughs> Alexa. Uh, then of course Google uses it to improve search because well modeling knowledge and relating things to each other you can greatly increase your insight in how the world uh, uh, fits together. And well, chatbots are an also, also an, uh, another example. So this is how you express a query. I'm just gonna speed up a bit. Uh, coming to the Drupal part of things, um, what did we do? Uh, well, we have this project called JoinUp um, where we have this catalog of reusable solutions, uh, open source. We try to express everything uh, there in a machine readable format so that people can also use, reuse our catalog. Um, and it is really a federated portal. So the, there are member states of the, of the European Union that have their own catalog and we harvest data from them and turn it, uh, throw it together into one European uh, catalog. It's licensed under uh, EUPL and it's open source. If you grab the slides, you can click on all those things and uh, get to the GitHub page. So what was really the, the thing that, that uh, we, we required, well, that were required of, of us, the team that was uh, responsible of, of the implementation? Well, it has to be, it, the solution uh, had to be free and open source. Um, we, were, we, we had the requirement that it, uh, our project uh, was, had to be open source, which is always, of course, very nice. Drupal was part of the requirements because there are a lot of um, there is a lot of uh, knowledge in the European Commission on Drupal. They know how to host it. Well, if you have a stack like this, um, try to reuse it. We had to publish our data as open data, so hence the uh, RDF part, and then um, harvesting of other catalogs, so integrating uh, data sources. And of course, well, uh, the whole solution had to stay compatible with uh, the contributed modules in, in the Drupal ecosystem. So uh, that was another thing that we wanted to safeguard. What did we do? Well, we swapped out uh, the database layer of Drupal. So we wrote our own um, ORM, let's say. We made a, a module that plugs into Drupal and that simply, instead of doing uh, SQL, it uh, does Sparkle, and since it's uh, Drupal has a quite uh, well-defined uh, database abstraction layer, we can we can now express the same type of uh, 
queries in the in the ORM uh, as it would go to to a SQL database. Uh, so whenever we hit save on a, on a form, it just goes goes to the to the Sparkle to the triple store database that stores everything in RDF instead of. And that was really our goal, was uh, not to store any linked data concepts outside of the infrastructure layer, not to use any of those concepts. So it's a normal Drupal site from the outside, uh, only on the infrastructure layer we, we have linked data things. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. <laughs> Coming to, uh, it's not very readable. Uh, the resolution uh, got to me. But what you see here uh, is on the right side, we have uh, two databases that we use. We store part of our content in a relational database and part of our um, content in a triple store database. And everything fits then into the CMS system. And we had to do a bit of trickery because, well, if you have two completely different database uh, technologies, things get a bit tricky if you have to do a query. Uh, so uh, in the end, we decided to, well, let's index everything in Apache Solar and we run our queries against Solar. And then when we do object loads, we just get them from the, from the database. And that worked out perfectly fine. We also have a copy of this uh, triple store database that we put out in the public. And, and there we have our public Sparkle endpoint so you can, you can go and query this. So quickly, some lessons learned. Uh, our objects, well, everything all loads from the database. We, since Drupal likes caching, we ended up with a Redis server. So in, also our objects gets, gets cached in, in Redis. And our queries go to, to, to uh, Solar. So in the end, the database, the triple store database and the MySQL are just sitting there being idle. Only when somebody saves something, uh, something gets written there. Of course, um, what I think is the huge potential for big organizations is this ability of uh, extending data models and still being compatible with, uh, with the base data model. So imagine you have 200 websites in an organization. Every organizational unit has a different notion of what a news item means. Uh, this one director wants to have a subtitle in his news. Uh, you can accommodate for this and still operate. You can query on the corporate level with, uh, with the shared data model. And on the local level, uh, those specific websites can use their uh, specific models. It's awesome for data integration. So our data coming from the member states, we can just pipe it uh, through and get it all in our uh, triple store database, of course, with validation in the process. And um, working with reference data, like uh, we have code lists of countries, uh, languages, these kind of things, it's, uh, it's really enjoyable because we can, we can simply um, remove everything related to a certain topic and replace it with a new version and everything is still there and working. Now let's have a round of questions. Okay. Thank you. So we have uh, seven minutes for questions. Yep, excellent. Okay, great. When you say that you use both uh, a relational database and a, a triple database, is it simply a matter of everything that the system knows, the, the ontologies that it knows is the, the relational database and all the predicates that we don't know are the triples or is it No, uh, so the question was, um, is everything stored in every database and or if, if, the, if the, is the data that we cannot express in a relational model stored in, a data, in the triple store or uh, where it goes what kind of data? The, well, the, um, the reality is that we have a part of our uh, data model that is standardized we use uh, ADMS AP, which is a um, sort of DCAT AP um, uh, variation. Uh, and um, all of the entities that are described in this model, we tr store in, uh, in the triple store database. Everything else, news, events, they go to uh, the, the relational model. Um, it was 
if we would have the, 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 the tooling that we built now uh, when we started, probably we, we would have expressed everything in RDF. Um, but at that time, it was very difficult to, uh, to rely on the thing. And things like versioning are also uh, not so easy in RDF. Uh, and that's why we decided to make the split. Uh, yep, maybe. Uh, we're, uh, we're using Virtuoso, op the open source version. Um, it was what was what we got our hands out at the time, and it was working fine. So uh, there's, I think uh, by now there are better, maybe better products on the market, but uh, it's it works fine. Well, Virtuoso works works well. It scales pretty well. Uh, it's still one of the most performant ones. It's just that the documentation is uh, is horrible. <laughs> uh, so that that was more the challenge than uh, you had a question. So you mentioned that you use Solar uh, for uh, for queries, right? Yeah. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the question was, um, uh, can you do everything with Solar because the document it's a document database, and you sort of lose the uh, expressivity of Sparkle, uh, if I can summarize it? Um, well, we have parts uh, since we don't have everything in in um, in our triple store database, we had to do something. Um, Drupal works very entity based anyhow so it's not it's more a doc, it's more a natural document model i would say than than really graph data so it is already a, it's a bit it already puts a bit of an opinion on what your graph will look like um, but uh, what we do offer is for the so we have the one database we have the other database both of them have their query layer um, from, from Drupal. On top, we have an object model that is similar, that is the same for both of them. They're just uh, entities in the CMS. Uh, we index everything in Solar and, and then, well, you, our queries don't go pretty wild. It's, it's more retrieving things related to, well, um, yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's just simple things actually. Um, for the querying, the solar, um, the Sparkle querying, um, <coughs> we do offer a public Sparkle endpoint, which is a copy of all the, of a subset of all the graphs we have in our uh, main triple store. So there you can, everybody who wants to have the fine grain Sparkle things can, can use that. Any other questions? Or can we start? Switching. <laughs> Sorry about that.